to bring uh, the parliament under the control of the people. Uh, you'll see one example where that failed back in 74 on the desk there with the British counties campaign where people's counties were mucked up. They weren't consulted. Yorkshiremen were made into Lancashiremen and all sorts of dreadful things like that. And that's one part of the thing because local government and national government have all got to be out of control and under the professional politicians who are not responsible to us. And the Harrogate agenda, the whole idea is to bring it back into a regular form where parliament and indeed local councils are habitually compelled to seek the consent of those people whom they rule. Thank you, Neil. Well, I knew I was gonna to have to be quick and um, what's it called? The HS2 comes to mind. And, but I was told that when you're public speaking, you should say hippopotamus at the end of every sentence. Well, I think I'll be lucky if I get away with saying flee because I've really got to speed up. But the Harrogate agenda. So it's a political movement with six demands. Can I just ask, apart from seeing the sign over there, who's actually heard and knows anything about the Harrogate agenda? Good. Well, hopefully you'll know, you'll know a little more. And those that, that, that obviously don't or haven't heard of us will, will uh, get a good flavor for what we're all about. As Edwards uh, kindly said, and I thank him, of course, for inviting me here today to speak. I am the director of it, but there are very two important considerations. And I am, so I'm going to give you a flavour about the Harrogate Agenda. I will go through the six demands extremely quickly, but there are two very important ingredients you do need to, fo to focus on, um, which, which I've now sort of got embedded in my own brain. And these two considerations are... Uh, the first is a political consideration, and it is that our current system of governance needs reform as breaking into it is extremely difficult. Now, I don't suppose I really need to uh, convince you of that, but suffice to say, I think you all know that UKIP in its long life uh, of 20 odd years has never had an MP elected to, despite uh, uh, its um, popularity uh, to uh, Westminster. It had two defections and Nigel Farage, bless him, um, who stood against Burkow uh, came third to a chap dressed as a dolphin. So, you know, there are problems with uh, trying to break into the existing system. And that is a terribly important ingredient to uh, focus on. And the second are that the lessons learned from history, and Edwards alluded to it, the Chartist movement of 1838 to 1848. And again, can I ask you a question? Who has heard and knows anything about the Chartist movement? Well, funnily enough, there are more people who've heard about the Chartist movement than indeed have about the Harrogate agenda. But the lessons from the Chartists are, are terribly important with regards to the Harrogate agenda. And first and foremost, it is that it's a movement, or sorry, the Chartists were a movement, um, and they too had six demands, as we have. One of their demands was never enacted, which was for annual general elections. And you can understand where they were coming from. They wanted to hold the government to account on an annual basis. Um, but that was never enacted. The other five all were. Now, what you may not know is that those five that were enacted were enacted by existing parties because of pressure on MPs. And uh, the five, those five demands were enacted between 20 and 73 years. That's how long it took. That is how long the political reform took. And I'll just give an example of one, one of those five, which is a secret ballot. Now, you will take this completely for granted that when you go into your village or town hall, you go into your own little booth, you tick the bit of paper, you come out and you put it in, a, you put it in the box. Well, obviously, before the secret ballot, which is, I mean, just fundamental, isn't it? You can't believe it could take a long time for people to, or politicians to agree to that but it took them 34 years from the Chartists demanding it. So those two considerations that our system needs to be reformed and secondly, we need to learn from history. So that, those two lessons both give us this, this formula, the pressure on MPs, existing MPs, plus time, and that could well be a generation, equals political reform. So the Harrogate Agenda, what is it? 
Well, it's a non-membership organization, so it has supporters, so we don't have to get into the business of membership cards and data protection and all that. We just have supporters. It's not a political party, nor ever will be, so long as I'm involved in it. It is a movement to provide pressure onto uh, our existing MPs. It is not issue-based, so we'll never get sort of down to the nitty-gritty of parking problems in Cheltenham or any other problem in another town, whatever it be. We have our six demands, and that's what we're pushing for. And we seek change, therefore, which goes to not being a political party, from outside the, 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 the system. We have revolutionary ambitions. When, you, when I quickly run through our six demands, you will see that they are revolutionary without a doubt. And we're certainly for non-violent for non confrontation. As soon as you enter into, into any form of violent protest, and remember, we're not, I know you'll probably laugh, we're not dealing with a dictatorship in West, Westminster, far from it. And those of you that have read Gene Sharp's good little book from dictator to, dictatorship to democracy, there are, there are loads of ways, peacefully, to uh, put pressure on a, well, in his book, for a dictator, but there are loads of ways to put pressure on a government that are, that are non-violent. And as soon as even you get into demonstrations, mass demonstrations, the chances of them being overtaken by actually Asian profiteurs from the government, or indeed people just out of control on the sides, then you enter into a possibilities of violence. And lastly, we're uncompromising to the extent that our six demands come as a package. We're not prepared to see one hived off from the, the other. And what is the objective? What is, in fact, this whole purpose of the Harrogate Agenda all about? Well, it's about power for the people within a truly democratic framework. So we have six demands, and I've already said, um, apropos that speeding railway line that they propose, um, I'm going to have to be quick. So it is a very brief explanation, but I do have a pamphlet over there at the very reduced price of a pound rather than five pounds, and I do hope you will all go and buy one. Um, it'll help with the Harrogate Agenda budget that is small, I, uh, very small, and um, it will explain in detail, actually, although it's only 30 pages, the uh, detail of each demand. So our first demand is a recognition of our sovereignty. Sovereignty, as you, as you should know, means power, basically, and we want to return sovereignty to the people. Now, in a very simple sort of evolutionary way, man and woman were responsible for, for themselves, they had their own power, and ultimately, over a period of time, they gave it up to a monarch, and if the monarch said, off with your head, you lost your head. And then, in this country, from 1215 onwards, the Magna Carta, and especially over those 200 years from 1215, the first 200 years, sovereignty was uh, taken from the monarch and taken into Parliament. But over the last 800 years, including those first 200 to bring us up to date, Parliament still increases its powers on a regular basis, albeit um, leaving aside the fact that they gave power over to the EU, of course. And so what... And there's, make no mistake about it, that is where power now lies. I mean, yes, every five years we have, the, uh, we have a general election when it's, the power is given back to us on a temporary basis, just for a day, but thereafter, Parliament can basically do what it likes. And it doesn't matter how much, you, how much we protest or whatever we say or do, we can't change the, the will of Parliament. So we want power to return to the people. We take the guidance from the EU Constitution, which, as you should all know, starts with the people, and uh, the government to become our servants and not our masters. I, I can't believe anybody would disagree with that. Our second demand is for real local democracy, where we want a bottom-up structure. Now, this is revolutionary, um, but we want uh, the... Uh, in fact, we think they should be based, which will please the, the, the uh, traditional counties group here. We think that uh, the, the, the basic unit should be the traditional counties as were. I mean, maybe with the odd tweak, but that's a detail that we don't need to get into at this stage. But they should be legislators in their own right, and they should raise the taxes and submit them up to the center rather than the other way around, which happens now. And that means that the, the, the local politician, the local councillor, call them whatever they would become, are far more important uh, than uh, um, locally than um, 
one's existing MP. Yes, we'd still have national MPs, but that would mean a reduction in size if there's far more happening at the local level in terms of hospitals and schools would be down to a county situation. So the reduction in size could be considerable at the centre. And if America can, uh, if the House of Representatives in America, that I believe is about 420, which is the equivalent of our commons, they have 420 people in it to govern 320 odd million Americans, then it really is farcical that we have 650 MPs to govern 66, 65 million of us. So the House of Commons could be happily reduced to 300, and uh, Lord Stoddard's gone, has he? Although I'm sure he probably wouldn't disagree agree with this. But the House of Lords, which of course is huge, um, we believe, although this is a detail that would come out way down the line, I mean, could be renamed the Senate and be about 100 people maximum. So there would be a reduction in size at the centre, and you would only need, really, uh, a Treasury a home and foreign affairs department, a defense department, and you know, maybe a another, but everything else would be down to the local areas. Our third demand is for a separation of powers, uh, and this is where the cabinet is separate from parliament. Now, again, I would hope you'd know this, but maybe you don't. We have to, we look to America as the sort of basic example here. Trump's cabinet, and this isn't an issue with Trump or whoever is the president, Trump's cabinet is comprised of people that are not in the Senate or the House of Representatives. And if they were in either, they have to resign to be in his cabinet. That means the whole of the executive, the cabinet, is held to account by the government, the, the two chambers. And the same would, be, uh, uh, the same would apply here. So we want to see our cabinet separate from a parliament. It has to be approved, the cabinet has to be approved, as it does in America, by parliament, but it is separate from it. And that means that um, it, it's, it's, it's held better to account. We'd want to see an elected prime minister. At the time of a general election, you would elect the prime minister. And if we had that, you would not have had Major taking over from uh, Thatcher. You would not have had Brown taking over from Blair without our consent. And you would not have had May taking over from Cameron. The monarch is unaffected, completely unaffected. She remains head of state, and um, God bless her. Not so sure about Charles, but we'll pass on that. Um, our fourth demand is the most complicated to explain, and it's explained very well in the pamphlet. But this is the people's consent, and it's involved around the use of referenda, rather like they do in Switzerland and direct democracy. And, uh, but we envisage, by the stage this comes in, remember these are generational changes we're advocating here, that there will be an electronic system, rather like our lottery in every newsagent, where voting by us, the people, is... Uh, far quicker and easier than it would be by visiting a local town hall. So given that um, factor, uh, which could easily be, be implemented if there was the will to do it, our first form, there are three forms of referenda that could be held. The first is an advisory referendum where the people can generate the issue. So the people might choose during a session, uh, during a five-year term of parliament, that they wanted to have, uh, they, they wanted a referendum on the classic, say, capital, capital punishment. But because that had come from the people, it would only ever be advisory, and the government doesn't have to implement it, it's just an advisory. But by not implementing it, they, they could face the wrath of the people at the next general election. Sorry, another point I should have made about the three, sorry, the use of referendums in these three types of occasions is that there would always be benchmarks to be met. So you'd have to have a certain benchmark of petitions, which would generate the whole thing in the first place, but you'd have to have a certain number met. Uh, you'd then have to have a certain turnout uh, of the electorate for it to be valid, and then, of course, you'd have to have the majority of those that voted to get the thing uh, passed. The second is the ability to actually reject government legislation. Now, during the process uh, that a bill passes through, it's, it, it goes to the Commons, it, it goes to the Lords, and it sits on the table in front of the Speaker, the, there's a certain passage of time and then before it gets royal assent. What we are saying is during that time, uh, the people should have the right to raise uh, uh, 
if they get the petition and everything else that goes with it, a referendum to say yes, what well, they wouldn't say yes, if they, if they accept the piece of legislation that just goes through. But if they want to say no to it, like the Iraq war, for example, the protest said absolutely nothing, but that could have been stopped if this uh, second principle of the people's consent was in force. And third and lastly, at a sort of more local level perhaps, but also nationally, uh, the people through referenda could challenge local bodies of planning, judges, and ministers. Uh, our fifth demand, no tax or spending without consent, uh, is applicable at the local and the national level. This would be an annual event, skip, skipping to the third point there, um, and we would be asked, it's our money, no government has their own money, ever, it is our money they're spending, and we say that uh, we should have the right to say no to the budget. And this in the pamphlet is explained where actually three councils did ask the people, did they want to spend uh, the same as last year, 10% uh, more or 10% less, and um, in recent times that's, that's happened, and the people were always quite sensible with their uh, ju judgments. And so, yes, in the middle, the, the whole purpose is the ability to reject the annual spending plans. And if the people do at the annual uh, referendum, then um, the government carries on because it still gets the money it had the year before. And last but by no means least, a constitutional convention, uh, which uh, has three, three parts there. A codified constitution. We, we believe it is time for us to have it written. That's what codified means, constitution to limit, to, to define the powers and in including a Bill of Rights. And I don't know whether you know this, and I only learned this actually this week, something I should have known, but there are only five countries in the whole world that have unwritten constitutions, um, and they are us, Canada, Saudi Arabia, New Zealand, and Israel, and every other country has a written constitution and seems to manage quite well on it, and indeed, Germany's, of course, we actually helped write off after the war, or did write for them after the war. The Constitution, um, so, so we the people tell Parliament to have this Constitutional Convention to form our, uh, to, to form the, um, the Constitution, written Constitution. We then approve it, we then approve it uh, uh, in a referendum, and then there's a Constitutional Court to ensure that the people um, sorry, that the Constitutional Court ensures that the Constitution is kept to, with the people being ultimate arbiters on any changes that um, are envisaged or wanted or suggested to the Constitution. This is whistle stop. I've nearly finished. No, no idea how long I've taken. So let me <laughs> leave you with this final thought. Nothing will change until we, the people, are sovereign and have the real power to say no.